colors no one uses but you should in today's video we're going to look at some of the most underrated colors in your paint box and maybe even a few that you haven't heard of before welcome back to my channel if you are new here my name is michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolor as well as color mixing videos like this one some drawing mixed media even some business and motivation for artists too please do consider subscribing if you click the little bell icon you can get notified every time i have a new video for you i make at least one free video a week here on youtube on a thursday with extra content for patreon subscribers so I called today's video colors no one uses, get that drama, get those clicks on YouTube. Of course, if no one used them, the manufacturers wouldn't make them. But nevertheless, these are colors that are either um, a little bit less well known or they might be colors that are sort of lurking in your beginner's set, but you don't ever really get around to using them. So these are colors that I consider to be quite underrated. I'm gonna swatch each one for you and demonstrate it and talk a little bit about the uses of that color. And hopefully you'll find some new colors and some new ways of working within this video. I just want to address the fact that one or two of you have complained about the, um, the audio on the videos lately. I am having a few issues. You can see I'm not wearing my lapel mic. We, uh, we found that it had broken and when we tested it out, there was nothing wrong with it. It was actually the connection with my phone. So I need to buy a new phone. I'm not independently wealthy. YouTube is not my job and um, no one else is paying my bills for me. So uh, I do have that in mind and I will be getting a new phone within the next couple of weeks. But um, meantime, hang in there. Hopefully you can hear what I'm saying well enough at least to understand the video. So I'm gonna get on now and talk about these 10 colors that I really think are underrated and that you should be using. First on my list today is Nickel Titanate, which is a yellow. Now you may be used to using lemon yellow, it's probably the lightest yellow in your paint box, but I want to talk today about this other yellow that's a little bit more um, opaque, a little bit acid, a little bit less green. It's a really, really interesting color and one that I find very useful indeed. So I've got the camera set quite low and um, I've got some scraps of paper here. I'm going to swatch my colors. So this is the Nickel Titanate and it looks, at first glance, it looks similar to lemon yellow. If you're wondering why it's in this little pot, this is because um, most of the paints, not all, but most of the paints I'm using today are from Jackman's Art Materials, who I work with in the UK. And they often send me manufacturers samples, so that's why these are in little pots. They're all available as tubes as well as pans, and um, there is a discount code in the description of this video. But all the colors I'm using today are available from pretty much every major manufacturer. So here is my nickel titanate. So um, I hope you can see that it's a lot softer than lemon yellow. It's a lot less acid. In other words, it tends a lot less towards green. It's slightly opaque and it's a really delicate color. So if you ever have to paint something like primroses and um, you want that real pale yellow, but you just can't seem to get the right shade, then this is the one for you. Another thing that I really love it for is if I've got sort of distant wheat fields or something like that. Because it's opaque, it really seems to glow if you use it in the distance. A lot of people are afraid of opaque colors. But they're really only a problem if you end up sort of mixing them in with everything and polluting everything with them. So let me just clean my paintbrush and see if I can swatch some cadmium lemon. This is a Talon's Rembrandt and we'll give that a swatch nearby. So can you see the difference? It's a beautiful color and it's great for mixing bright greens and things like that. But sometimes when you've got those very, very pale petals, I'm thinking because I'm in the UK here, we have these primroses in the spring and the lemon just isn't the right color for them, no matter how much you water it down. So do have a look at nickel titanate. If you are in the UK and you have previously bought SAA colors, they had a primrose yellow um, obviously named after the flower and that one was the same pigment so that's actually a nickel titanate even though they haven't labeled it as such. SAA colors I think they've been reformulated so I'm not up to speed with the current uh, range I don't know if that is one of their current ranges but do have a look at this color it's really really beautiful and really really useful. So next up, I've got another yellow for you, and this one is Naples yellow. Again, it's a color that sometimes people shy away from because it also has some opacity, but it's a really interesting color. I don't use it that often, but when I do use it, I find it really, really helpful. Let me show you what it looks like, and I'll explain what I use Naples yellow for. 
So here's my Naples yellow. This one um, has dried up a little bit. I probably left the, uh, the lid off at some point. So I'm going to sort of scrub at this one a little bit. This is almost a related color in that it's another sort of semi-opaque color. So it has a creaminess to it. So although there are lots of warm yellows you can get, things like Indian yellow and cadmium yellow deep, which tend to be fairly transparent, this one is a bit more opaque. And as I said, it has that warmth to it, but it also has that creamy softness to it. And I think it's a really beautiful color. I mostly use this one for landscapes. Again, it's fantastic for those distant wheat fields where one of those orangey colors would be too bright, but something like a yellow ochre would be uh, too dull and too granular. And watered down, it's really lovely as well. So again, another beautiful yellow for landscapes and flower paintings. Next up we have quinacridone rose or sometimes called quinacridone pink. It's a synthetic colour. You may have used alizarin crimson, you may even have a permanent rose. Quinacridone rose is just a little bit more towards the blue end of the spectrum. It's a fantastically useful colour for mixing and for florals. I couldn't be without it. I'm going to link to a video. I'll try and put the link up above. It doesn't show on all devices. If it's not there, have a look in the video description. I'll put a link all about pink and the uses I have for it within my palette. It's one of the most vital colours for mixing with. It's a completely underrated. Let me show you quinacridone rose. So next I have quinacridone rose. At first glance, it appears to be like any other madder, any other rose and alizarin. And if you have a beginner's set and you only have alizarin crimson, they sometimes put it in beginner's sets, I do encourage you to get a pink. It's so vital for color mixing. You will not get a strong, beautiful, vibrant purple without a good pink, for instance. It's also the opposite color of green and it's on the cool end of the spectrum. So it's fantastic for neutralizing greens. It's fantastic for mixing with things like Payne's Gray to get those deep, moody purples. There are so many uses for what I call a blue based pink. So if you imagine you have pinks at one end of the spectrum, that would be something like a sunset, an orangey pink. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, we sort of, you know, almost like your Barbie pink. And that is your cool pink. Like I said, it's just a little bit further into the blue spectrum than permanent rose, which is another beautiful color. You don't necessarily, if you've already got permanent rose, you don't necessarily have to have this one. But if you do a lot of color mixing and particularly a lot of flower painting, you're going to find this one very beautiful. As I said, it goes towards the blue end of the spectrum without going as far as being into magenta. It's fantastic for florals and it's also absolutely invaluable for color mixing. As always at this point, if you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, can I ask you please to click the thumbs up button, click the like button, it really helps my channel to grow. YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction, so if you like, subscribe, share, or even leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people and I can teach more people how to paint. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. Next up, we have red oxide. Now, this is a strange pigment. This is a pigment that has many variations and comes under many different names. You may have heard of it as English red. You may have heard of it as Venetian red, as red oxide. It has so many different names and it has so many different shades because not all single pigments look exactly the same. There is, unlike the, what you may read on many Facebook groups, there is actually a huge amount of variation within a single pigment number. And this is one of the pigments that varies the most. It's really, really beautiful. It can range anywhere from sort of a terracotta, a brick red, right through to sort of more a pinkish red, which is often labeled Venetian red, but you know, there, there isn't really any rule for this. So I'm gonna show you a couple of versions of red oxide now and explain why it's so useful in your palette. So I've got two red oxides here, and I think even from the base of the pot, you can see the difference. This one is lighter and more orangey, and this one is redder. So that's that color difference that I talked about. And can you see they've got little, um, these are uh, manufacturer samples, they've got little um, numbers on here. So the pigment number, pigment red 101. So they're both the same pigment number, but can you see this, uh, I think it's millimeters here. This is as far as I know, I believe it to be the grind number. So in other words, that's how big the pigment is ground. So when you look at a color, your eyes are, um, interpreting the light that bounces from it. So the amount that the pigment is ground is actually gonna affect the color you see. So, uh, you know, a finely ground pigment 
and a coarse ground pigment. They may be the same, exact same material to start with, but they're going to appear different. There are also other differences that you get, um, being from different parts of the world, etc., etc., different qualities. So a huge amount of difference within this one pigment range. So here we have, and um, at the beginning I was telling you all the different names that this pigment comes under. Another very common name to find it under is light red. Now that's confusing because in certain brands, for instance, Talon's Rembrandt, their light red is actually a scarlet red. But many, many brands label this red oxide as light red. Can you see there how useful it is? So that's going to be useful for all sorts of things. Um, terracotta pots, brilliant for doing brickwork, things like that. And then you get this sort of darker, redder version. This one is often named Venetian red, but really there isn't, um, you know, there isn't, there's a big difference in color. You can see the big difference in color, but um, th there isn't always a um, an exact science for how the, uh, the manufacturers choose to name them and choose to call them. You know, some of the, uh, like Talons, for instance, will call it um, English Red because they're a Dutch company. You know, an English company will call it Venetian Red. I think it always sounds better if it's uh, from another country, doesn't it? So you get this other end of, and this is quite an extreme one as well, you get this other end of the spectrum where you've got these more brownish reds. Colour like this, absolutely fabulous for doing rooftops. And sometimes as well, when you get that sort of dark, here in the UK, we get those kind of felted roofs on some buildings. So I'm going to put some Payne's Grey in it. And you can see that you can get really, really interesting darks by mixing these colours as well. And for this lighter one here, you can drop all sorts of yellows and things in and get your brickwork colours. So red oxide, huge difference between the, uh, the pigment grinds and the pigment quality and the pigment sourcing. So I would try and get a tester if you can, or at least have a look at the colours on the internet so you can see what sort of colour um, is available to you. Some manufacturers, such as Jackman's, which I'm sampling here, have more than one pigment available, so you can choose the type that you like. So we seem to be working our way through the primaries here, don't we? We've had a couple of yellows, a couple of reds. Let's look now at some blues. So the first one I want to talk about is Ultramarine Green Shade. Now I have had people argue with me in the comments before now when I've uh, talked about a colour that tends towards you know, a green or a yellow or red end of the spectrum and it has the word shade after it. Now this is something that manufacturers do. They use the word shade to indicate which end of the colour spectrum it comes from. And yes, I do know that that's not an accurate way to uh, describe the word shade. If you look up the word shade, it certainly doesn't mean hue. It means an amount of uh, lightness and darkness. It's tonal. However, it's not my fault that manufacturers use it wrong, so please don't start a big row with me in the comments. Ultramarine is usually um, tending towards the red end of the spectrum. In other words, it looks a little bit on the purple side. So ultramarine green shade tends a little bit towards the green end of the spectrum. It's a beautiful color. It's very similar to cobalt, but much, much brighter. I was sent a sample of it a few months ago and I absolutely fell in love with it. I did a beautiful painting with it, at least I think it's beautiful, of some white roses and um, I got quite abstract in the shadows. I'll put a picture of it up here if I can find it. And um, I just couldn't get enough of this ultramarine blue green shade. Let me swatch it for you, it's beautiful. So look at this colour here, look how bright it glows. It's absolutely an amazing colour. So let's swatch this one, making sure that my paintbrush is clean and here we are. So normally within sets you may get um, an ultramarine and next to it you may get a cobalt and cobalt is very similar to ultramarine. It's a bit less blue but I could tell you that this ultramarine green shade seems to come out brighter than any cobalt ever does and it also is a similar sort of blue. So if you want that real mid-range blue, so a blue like this, I mean I just like using it on its own but also it's a little bit more realistic for a sky. If you like ultramarine skies, and I do find beginners get into trouble, I generally advise beginners not to use ultramarine skies. But this one here, I think it's absolutely lovely and quite realistic and it doesn't have that purple tone that French ultramarine and standard ultramarine seem to have. It's a beautiful, beautiful color and it's one of my favorites. So we've had two of each primary, so let's have our second blue. 
and for this one I have manganese blue hue. Now this one is actually unlike most of the ones I'm using today. This is a Daniel Smith color and the pigment number on the tube suggests to me that it's somewhere in the phthalo range. It looks quite different to a standard phthalo blue though. It's uh, got the word hue after it and what this means is that Daniel Smith are trying to replicate manganese blue. So I had a look online and it turns out that manganese blue is um, toxic or has problems with um, being toxic in the manufacturer. I didn't look into it um, too deeply. You're welcome to go and Google that if you want to go down a rabbit hole of uh, pigment information. But basically uh, Daniel Smith have made this color that they think looks a lot like manganese blue. I tend to use it as a brighter and stronger version of cerulean blue. So if you're used to using cerulean blues in your skies, and you, you love that sort of that granular, light turquoisey blue, but you'd like something with a bit more punch, let me show you manganese blue hue. So talking of skies regarding the last color, here we have the, uh, the manganese hue, and look at that. So as I said, the, uh, the pigment seems to have a basis in phthalo, but it's just much, much softer. They've managed to sort it out with the binders and whatnot. You know, these, uh, these manufacturers spend a lot of time adjusting binders. I do get fed up when I see people sort of saying, oh, well, it's just the same pigment. You can just make that color from this other color. I don't think they realize what's involved in the manufacture of paints. So this is a really beautiful color. And as I said, it's, uh, it's very similar to Cerulean, but it's just a lot brighter and a lot cleaner and a lot more punchy. So if you're looking for something in a sky that's like Cerulean, but just a bit brighter, try this manganese blue hue. So we've had some primaries, let's look at a couple of secondaries. The first one I have for you is chrome oxide green. It's sometimes called chromium oxide green. It's exactly the same, they're just abbreviating it on some tubes, on some pans, they're just abbreviating that name from chromium to chrome. And it's a really, really interesting sort of granular dull gray green. Now the thing is I find with greens is what you get, you get sort of two schools of uh, beginners and the way that they go wrong with greens. Uh, one lot of beginners will have something like, you know, they'll have perhaps a poor quality cerulean and an ultramarine and all of their greens will be very granular, very heavy, and because of the ultramarine, they'll be very dull. Now, there's nothing wrong with an ultramarine green, except if you use ultramarine for all of your greens, and then you're gonna find, because of that hint of red in there, you're going to find that dullness to the greens. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, and the people that have maybe a phthalo green or a phthalo blue, and all of their greens are way too bright, way too acid. Again, there's nothing wrong with these bright greens either. What you're looking for in your painting is a range of greens because if they're all very dull or all very bright it just becomes too much. So if you're looking to add a new green to your box this one is a really really beautiful one. It's not a strong color but if you're looking for those soft gray greens it can be really useful and it never looks harsh and unnatural. So here's my chrome or my chromium oxide green and uh, let's pick up a little bit of it. It's a fairly weak color. It's not as weak as some and it's rather muted and dull and it's very granular. So can you see what a lovely color this is for your natural landscapes and particularly your natural uh, garden painting and flower painting. If you just need that very cool, very pale, almost gray green, there you have it. You could also, of course, I'll just pick up a tiny bit of lemon yellow on my brush. You can, of course, adjust it. And there we are with some lemon in. We've also got these lovely greens appearing. And because of the qualities of it, whatever you mix with it, it's never gonna end up looking too unnatural. So if you have a problem with greens that look just too unnatural, do try chrome oxide green. Next up, we have perylene violet. So we've got another secondary color. Now, if you're used to having something like a blue violet in your box, a permanent blue violet, you'll be used to that really strong sort of royal purple, that very blue based purple. But purples aren't always uh, blue based. And if you think of things like plums and aubergines, you have that warmer sort of reddish purple. Perylene violet is a great color for this if you don't want to have to mix it yourself. So I'm gonna swatch this one for you. And I do suggest that you check out all of the perylene colors as well. They all have this kind of dark, murky, kind of gothic feel. And yet they can also be very, very pure colors. I was sent a swatch the other day. I'm not gonna show it in this video, but I was sent a swatch the other day of perylene black green shade and um, absolutely stunning. I'll definitely be using that in one of my paintings coming up. But the most common perylene that you will find is the perylene violet. So let me show you what it looks like. 
So here is my perylene violet. It's a beautiful colour, looks good enough to eat. So let's swatch some of this and look at that. So it's just a little bit more the aubergine end of the spectrum. You're probably sort of looking there and thinking, well, it just looks purple to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swatch a true permanent blue violet. This colour here is uh, another Jackman's colour, this perylene violet. And as I said, all the perylene colours are really very sort of interesting and gothic. If you like a really interesting colour, those are the ones for you. So I'm going to swatch here a little bit of the, uh, the Talons Rembrandt. This is their permanent blue violet. So this is what you would normally expect from a, a violet, I imagine, is this much more purple blue shade. So let's just water that down a little bit. I just want to show you the difference. So, you know, you can start out with a, a split primary set. You can add one or two other colours. If you're adding in secondary colours, that's your orange, your green, your purple. There's something to be said for having a warm and cool of each version. And if you wanted a warm and cool of um, each purple, then this would be the one to have. As I said, fantastic for flowers, for fruit, that sort of thing. Anywhere that you've got, you know, particularly fruit, things like figs, things like plums. And of course, not, um, not impossible to be used as a sunset colour too. If you've got those real strong darks in your sunsets, I never use black to outline things like trees and those things that you see in the front of sunsets. I always try and find a strong dark colour and a beautiful aubergine like this is really, really interesting. This colour is perylene violet. So my next colour isn't really one that could be said to be never used. It's in a lot of beginner's sets. Some people may use it all the time. Other people may completely ignore it. It's definitely underrated and that is raw umber. So raw umber, unlike many of the browns, it's not a warm brown. It's rather a weak brown as well. And a lot of people sort of look at it in their box, especially if you've got pan paints and think, well, this is a bit wishy-washy. What on earth do I do with this? But I think it's absolutely vital. It's a fantastic colour. I've included it in my own beginner's set. If you want details of that, it's in the video description. Raw umber can be mixed. It's uh, really, really useful for making soft greys. I find it invaluable if I'm painting something like pathways or concrete. It's also really good for light sort of tree trunks where you don't need that sort of additional warmth. It's a fantastic colour as well for cooling down something like yellow ochre so that you can get realistic sand and on its own it can also look a lot like wet sand depending of course on what part of the world you come from. Let me swatch raw umber for you and show you how to mix it. So here's my raw umber. I have other tubes of it and I have other manufacturers of it as well. So you can see that I've used almost all of this. And the reason for that is it's a really weak colour. So you need quite a lot of it. So if you've got a tube, you need to squeeze out quite a lot. So look at that. It's a really interesting natural colour. I mean, it almost looks like the colour of my drawing board. So it's great for wood. It's great for things like driftwood. You can use it to paint trees if you've got a light brown tree and there's no red in it. It's a great colour for that as well. A couple of mixes that I do with it. One thing that I do is to mix a little bit of paint grey in it and you can get almost a warm sort of concrete colour. So let's put that paint grey in there and do you see how it's sort of warming it up and you get this very interesting neutral appear. It's almost the colour of concrete and pathways and stones. So this is an interesting way of making a warm grey. Now one disclaimer on this, it does depend on your manufacturer. So some raw umbers have more yellow in than others, or at least are more towards the yellow end of the spectrum. And some Payne's greys have more blue in than others. If your raw umber has a lot of yellow and your Payne's grey has a lot of blue, you could end up with a greenish hue here instead of grey. If that happens, you just need to pop a little bit of your pink in, your quinacridone pink or even your permanent rose, and that will just balance out the green. So that's just something that happens with some manufacturers. It doesn't happen with this one and it doesn't happen with the talons either. I don't have any others in my range at the moment, but it is a possibility. I've seen it with some of my students that uh, they end up getting a green by mistake. Another mix I like to do for this is with yellow ochre. So if you've got some yellow ochre and you're trying to paint a beach and you know it's a little bit too bright perhaps, look at that. It's, it's not a bad beachy colour, but here in the UK certainly that would be uh, way too bright. We're not lucky enough to have anything that looks like that. So you can add a bit of your raw umber. You can almost use it as you know shadowy areas on your beach or just mix it in and you get a much more natural looking beach effect. As I said, on its own, it can look rather a lot like wet sand, so it's been quite good to, uh, to drop in 
If you're painting somewhere where the waves and the sand overlap, you know, that's quite a good color for getting in that area as well. So raw umber, a really underrated color. So continuing our theme of earth colors, we're going now for sepia. Now sepia is what they call mixed color. In other words, each manufacturer makes it from their own recipe using many different pigments, or at least several different pigments. It tends to be transparent. It's a very strong, cold, dark brown. With some manufacturers, it may be a little bit more into the gray or the yellow. As I said, it does vary. But I find it's a really, really useful color. Now, in a beginner's box, you'll nearly always get a burnt umber or a burnt sienna. And these are lovely, rich, dark browns. Now, if you only have those and you don't have sepia, I suggest that you try mixing one of those dark browns, putting some blue in it, preferably an ultramarine blue and or a cobalt. And then you'll find that you manage to sort of cool down that, uh, that warm brown, that's an uh, alternative, but you'll find it's a bit more granular than the ones you get from the manufacturers. Now, what I find the problem with burnt umber is, is that it's just not always realistic. Now, maybe if you live somewhere, you know, exotic, I'm saying exotic, if you live there, you probably don't think it's exotic at all. But, you know, if you live somewhere um, more towards, you know, South America or Australia or one of these hotter countries, you may have some very warm browns in your earths. But here in the UK, in Europe, we um, have our earth colour is, um, is very dull. It really doesn't have any warmth in it. So I find that this is a fantastic colour for dirt on the ground. It's a wonderful colour for tree trunks. If you have that cold, dark brown, it can be watered right down. It makes a fantastic fantastic colour for things like driftwood because it doesn't have that red in it, doesn't have that warmth to it. It's also great if you're doing something like a sunset and you've got a silhouette of trees and you want a real dark but you don't want to go into black. It's fantastic for that too. Let me show you sepia. So the colour I'm swatching for you now is sepia and it's a staining colour. You can see that it's very dark as you water it down it becomes more neutral and it's much more yellow based than some of the reds which tend to be much warmer so as i said if you've got a brown that really doesn't have that warmth to it and um, i'll swatch one next to it in a second so you can just see the difference so in my palette here i've got my uh, beginner set and rather than a burnt umber which most of them have i actually put a burnt sienna in which is warmer still Look at that beautiful colour. But you can see that it's not always the most natural colour. Certainly here in the UK, you know, our dirt, our earth, our tree trunks, they just aren't as warm as this. Of course, you can cool colours down and this is a great colour for other things. It's brilliant for things like terracotta. It sort of bridges the gap between the browns and the red oxides. So it's a lovely, uh, vibrant colour. But can you see how natural this sepia is and how you can really, really water it down? Fantastic if you've got a still life that's got those dried, pale seed pods in. It's amazing for tree trunks and it's also great for things like driftwood. There are multiple uses for sepia in your palette. So do let me know in the comments what you thought about these colours. Are any of them colours that you use or are they new to you? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts as well about any colours that you think are quite unusual but you use all of the time. Before you leave this video, don't forget to go into the video description. I've got some free downloadable PDFs for you there. You can access those for no money whatsoever. If you would like to watch me go through every single stage of my own paintings, including all of the drawing, all of the colour mixing, Patreon is the thing that you need. I'll put a link to Patreon in the video description so you can see what you get with a Patreon subscription. And of course, if you're looking for something more structured, I do have online courses for you as well. Earlier in this video, we talked about greens and the fact that some of them can be really bright. If the only greens you have in your paint box are just too bright, I have a great video that's going to show you how to adjust those greens and get the most from them so you don't have to discard them. You can still go ahead and use them. So if you've got that really bright phthalo green or that viridian, this video is going to show you how to adjust it and make it much more usable.